Dale Little here with Rescue American Ministries and uh, looking in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and um, <clears throat> I'll not go over all the things that we've already gone over uh, as far as the background uh, other than say that Paul was there in Thessalonica for a short time and um, <clears throat> the church was started uh, Paul ended up in Athens, but he was concerned about the church, and so he'd sent Timothy ahead, and Timothy had brought back word and had some questions that they had been asking and uh, needed Paul to clarify, so Paul wrote uh, these two le uh, letters to them. Uh, and so let's get started in, in verse 5. <clears throat> and basically, verse I mean chapter 5. Chapter 5 uh, the original documents did not have chapters and verses in it, so I, this really wasn't a good place, I think, to break. Um, but uh, he's talking about uh, Christ's return and, and you know, uh, the, what we call the rapture, being caught up. Now, people say, well, you know, you can't even find the word rapture in the Bible. Well, that's because it's a Latin word. Now, if you had a Latin Bible, you have something, a variation of that word or that word itself. Uh, but it, it's not because its meaning is basically to be caught up and um, <clears throat> that's what the word rapture means and, and Paul talks about that we would be caught up into the air so uh, you know the, the, the argument that it can't be found the doctrine can't be found in the Bible is ridiculous to anyone that you know knows really knows anything about the scripture but let's get started in, in chapter 5 and he just got through talking about um, uh, the return, you know, that uh, those that are dead are not going to go ahead uh, <clears throat> of those who are alive and remain on this earth when we're caught up. Uh, and uh, it, it, he ends the last chapter, which, like I say, really wasn't chapter. This flowed, you know, right together. They said, Wherefore comfort one another with these words they just spoke. But also, I think with the words, he's pure. He says, But at times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And we've talked a lot about this. I just, um, the day of the Lord, if you go back to the prophecies and other places in the Old Testament, um, the day of the Lord is not this great day that we think we're looking forward to. Matter of fact, Joel and some of the other prophets described it as a day of darkness and gloom. You know, the, the day of the Lord is when Christ comes back with his saints and those rebellious people on this that's left on this earth that's has shaken their fist in God's face and said, we'll do as we please. We don't need you. We'll run things ourselves, and we'll take over this earth. God will come back and destroy and set right. So it's not going to be a good day. And also, a case can be made, and has been, uh, <clears throat> that the day of the Lord actually starts after the rapture of the church at the beginning just before the tribulation period begins because we have to be taken out of the way because we as Holy Spirit dwells in, in us as God's people uh, withholds a lot of the evil in this world now you think well we're not doing a good job well you know it will get bad so bad that God will take us out of here and, and then there will be no restraint to the evil that's here and so will be caught up at that time and then after that is when basically you might say all hell breaks loose with the antichrist the the man of sin the beast <clears throat> all these different terms that's been given to him will be released and, and he'll be um, <clears throat> revealed he could be alive and ready to step out anytime uh, today I would not be surprised. Uh, but he cannot be revealed until we are removed. And that's why I say, 
and I've tried to tell people, you, if you're a child of God, you don't need to worry about the mark of the beast. If you're not a child of God, you need to be very worried. You need to, you need to come to Christ today, um, else it'll be too late. <clears throat> Because he will come suddenly the first time. He'll come suddenly the last time. But, uh, when he comes up at the end of the tribulation or near the end, when Israel finally recognizes him as the Messiah, and he will come back with his saints, he will destroy all the armies of the nations that have come against Jerusalem at that time. And so um, he mentioned there, and that's Paul talking. He's talking about the day of the Lord. Uh, and let, let's follow on. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. As travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay, so if you're left here, if you've not been taken up in the rapture when, at this day of the Lord, then you're in trouble. Those that say peace and safety, and I, I talk about this a lot. I'll keep talking about it because too many of you keep listening to them and following these false prophets. And that's what they prophesy. Peace and safety, wealth and health. Nothing's going bad. Nothing bad's going to happen. No, no, nothing. This world's just going to keep getting better and better. How does that look like it's been working out? Look around. Are you, well, I'm not saying it. I don't see how anyone can look at it, this world and see things as getting better and better. They're not. They're, it's getting worse and worse. Um, as I mentioned in, I think, the last chapter, uh, I was looking at a, a, a social media where someone had... Um, made the statement and made the case of um, how the Bible had influenced Western civilization. And you should see all the comments that just hatefully despise the Word of God, the Bible, and those that stand for it and preach it and present it in any way. Uh, you know, they say the Bible didn't influence anything. You know, it's all based on um, uh, Greek and Roman. Well, there was some influence there. They, the, the founders looked at a lot of things. But there's a hatred, a growing hatred of God's people and of the Word of God and of God. We talked about that earlier also in the last, um, in chapter 4 how the the those that call themselves atheists and we sometimes call them atheists are not true atheists they are god haters they recognize there's a god and they hate him uh you will not tell me what to do i'll do as i please so the day of the lord in verse two so cometh as a thief in the night for when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction and so all these prophets that keep prophesying things are going to get better and better. This great re latter rain revival is going to break out. Nonsense. That latter rain is mentioned a couple times in the Old Testament. And it's particularly, they like to go to the book of Joel. Well, Joel was talking to the Jewish people, his people, and God said he was going to send a latter, former in the latter rain. Well, he will when Israel recognizes him as the Messiah. And that will be deep into the tribulation period. So you're wasting your time. I mean, if you want to go through that, and some of you might, uh, if that's what you follow and that's what you believe. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not going to be here. I'm going to go up with the church to meet Christ in the air before all that starts. And then at the end of the tribulation, he will return with his saints. I'll be there with him. And you will too if he doesn't come back first. Um, well, even if he does. 
um, <clears throat> but we'll be there and return uh, with those at the end of that period. But that's when that light, God's going to bless Israel, pour out his blessings on them. And when he sets up his millennial kingdom, well, then there's going to be great things happening. But until then, until he comes back to set up his kingdom and Israel recognizes him as Messiah, you're wasting your time to wait for this great end times, latter rain revival that these false prophets keep talking about peace and safety oh everything's glorious it's going to become more glorious you better repent and that, see, that's one thing Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 23 God told the false prophets and, and they were the ones that were numerous Jeremiah was by himself but you had all these other prophets and people talk about well all these prophets are prophesying this it must be true well all those prophets were prophesying this peace and safety back in Jeremiah's day but they were all liars Paul and uh, Jesus uh, God said that if they had really prophesied my name in my name then they have would have turned his people from their sin. But people don't want to hear that. And that's the reason you follow these people because you don't want to hear that. You would rather hear somebody preach how wonderful you are, how deserving you are, how glorious God's going to bless you and nothing, nothing in this world is going to negatively affect you. Well, keep following. That's what you want to do. But it's wrong. And God will judge it. God will judge these false prophets. He'll judge those who follow these false prophets. He said, I'll send strong delusion that you'll believe a lie. If that's what you want to follow. And in Timothy, he talks about these false teachers. Uh, it says that having itching ears that people will heap to themselves these teachers. The teacher's not the one that's got the itching ears, it's the people. The people are the ones that have called for these. Hey, come, come, tell us something good. Give us good news. Oh, no, no, don't tell me I'm a sinner. Don't tell me I've got sin in my life. Don't tell me I need to repent of anything. Just tell me how good I am. Build up my self-esteem. Okay, let's hurry on. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us. Now here is where we need to pay attention. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God, listen, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The tribulation is going to be a period when God pours out his wrath. Jesus took our wrath. The, the Bible is clear on that, that he paid our, he took our wrath for us in our place. So he's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Here again, Paul, look what he says in verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now, besides, you know, the return of Christ here, let's look at one more thing. Edify one another. I hear people talk about uh, 
<clears throat> you know, the Bible never tells us to edify ourselves, to build ourselves up. It's just the opposite. We're to build other people up. And um, we're to edify the church. That's, that's you know, if we're part of the church, we're part of the body of Christ, it's our responsibility to edify the body and to esteem others as better than ourselves, what the Scripture says. But I hear these people mistake what Paul was saying in uh, Corinthians where he said, uh, them talking about speaking in tongues and um, and he made the statement that you know one that speaks in tongues edifies himself that was not a, a, a positive comment that was a negative thing I was saying you're doing that and you're edifying yourself you're not edifying the church you know let God edify you God will bring you up. And that's what, you know, that's plainly what the scripture teaches that let God promote us. We don't promote ourselves. But that's what we're doing. That, that's what those are doing when it says they're speaking in tongues uh, many times without an interpreter, I think, specifically. But I don't remember all the details right there. But uh, it, it does say, you know, that yeah, you're edifying yourself. And these people that take that up misinterpret that, misunderstand that, say, oh, well, that's for my edification, so, well, God, God didn't tell you to seek your own edification. You seek the edification of others if you're really doing what God wants you to do. Let's hurry on. Verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now feeble-minded, uh, from different, better translation maybe than that, but it's, it's not talking about somebody that's their mind's not all there or they're just, you know, not smart as some other people, but there, it it's, has to do with those that may be weak in the faith or young in the faith or just haven't grown as much um, in the faith in that respect. And see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good among both among themselves and to all men. In verse 16, is it? Rejoice evermore, and here's some things that list of things as Paul is closing here in this um, chapter five, and um, <clears throat> he says, um, "I'm trying to look at the time here. Yeah, okay, uh, not too bad, but quench not. Excuse me. Uh, let me back up. Rejoice evermore." Now he just got through talking about all this stuff. Now if he, you know, if he was talking about us having to go through tribulation, I don't. Yeah, it'd be hard to do that. Rejoice evermore. I, I know the Bible says, you know, rejoice even in the midst of uh, hard times. But he says, pray without ceasing. Now, I don't mean we're supposed to just quit work and stay home and pray all the time. You can pray wherever you're at. But in an attitude of prayer. And, boy, not even, most of us can't even do that. Um in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you do you realize that you can't give it? it's hard to give thanks if you're busy complaining about everything and you've got people Christians cause say they're Christians, children of God and that's all they do is complain ah, blah, blah, blah. you know I'm, you know this victim mentality uh, however that may work out. And then he says in 19, verse 19, quench not the spirit. That has the kind of the idea like if you've got a fire going and you, you pour water on it, put it out. Your actions, your words can often quench, your attitudes can quench the spirit of God. 
as he's trying to work in you and wanting to use you. Paul here says, quench not the spirit. Be careful you don't quench the spirit. Now, you're not going to get rid of him. You're not going to put, uh, so to speak, is doing away with his power, but you're going to quench his activity because it's, it's not going to work in a person who is constantly complaining and, and living wrong and, um, you know, those sorts of things. So quench not the spirit. Uh, criticizing everybody. Uh, you know, having a critical spirit. That's going to quench the spirit of God. And uh, you know, let me tell you something else, too. I don't get to say a whole lot about this. But if you are a social drinker, you drink alcohol, you, know, you realize that they call alcohol a spirit. <laughs> um, that's what the Indians, when <clears throat> they brought it here to America, called it, too. Um, if that is where you get your I don't know what to say about it uh, uh, relief from is through alcohol um, you know relaxation whatever you want to call it uh, your uh, it makes you feel good. It makes you bubbly, maybe. Uh, and of course, we know what it does to some people. It, you know, it goes way off in different directions. You cannot be filled with alcohol and be filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. Oh, the Holy Spirit may still live in you if you're a child of God. But there again, it, you're, he's going to be quenched. You can't have the power of both so you choose the way I said and I, I made a choice many years ago people ask me why you know you know why don't you social drink why don't you drink some once in a while uh, because I made a choice I don't want anything affecting me um, <clears throat> uh, mentally so to speak or spiritually um, I don't want to be dependent on anything. I want to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Okay? So despise not prophesying. Well, I hear that a lot from these false prophets. Oh, you, you say anything negative about them, you call out them, call them out for all the missed prophecies they've made. And they'll, oh, you, you know, Despise not prophesying. Well, I speak out against them. I do. I, I've took them to task over uh, the false prophets that's been prophecies that's been made the past year or so. I, I don't despise prophesying. I despise false prophesying. Now I didn't say I despise prophets, false prophets. I said I despise their false prophesying. God can still change hearts, and that's his business. But that they're always trying to defend themselves. You, you, you better not despise prophesying. Okay, well, I don't. Uh, not true prophesying. 21, here, here it says, right after, right after that, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. I can't overstate that. We do not bother as children of God today to prove very much of what comes our way, especially through social media and things. I've spoken out very strongly against the, the Q movement, the QAnons, because I studied it. I had someone that sent me a bunch of stuff that I was supposed to read. I saw enough. Well, you know, if you send me 50 things to check out, and the first three, four, or five that I check out all prove false, I'm not going to continue looking into all the rest of it. That was enough to, true, to show that it's based on false principles. Same way with all these false prophets. 
Same way. No different. Prove. But we just take people at their words. Well, it sounds good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I did say that. But yeah, we're supposed to abstain from evil. But we're supposed to go beyond that. Abstain from the very, from all appearance of evil. If you are doing something that someone might see, unless you're really where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. Now, you know, some people can accuse you of make false accusation. That's always a possibility. But other than that, if you're doing anything that some people might misread as a, you as a Christian, um, might appear that you're doing evil, things you shouldn't be doing, and the best thing is to avoid it. As it says here, abstain means, you know, stay away from it. Leave it alone from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. We already talked about that word sanctify in the last uh, chapter. It means to be set apart. God sets us apart the moment we are saved, and we are to continually be setting ourselves apart as we walk this world, this life. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful, get this, faithful is he that calleth you who will what? <laughs> who will do it? Just like uh, Philippians 1.6. We talk about being saved. We talk about eternal life, and you've got people that just cannot grab hold of it. Well, what if I mess up? What if I do? Oh, what if I? Well, if I'm glad I don't have to live that way. I'm glad I got that settled. Who called you? Did you just decide on your own to follow Christ one day? And, and without his calling without his drawing if you're real if you're a real Christian you didn't Christ is the one that prompted you and, and drew your spirit now, if he didn't you're not of any of his but if you did faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it Philippians 1 6 he that began a good work in you will complete it at that day it's not up to me oh well, you can just go out and live any way you want to then no I can't I, that desire is not that my desire is to please God oh yes there's temptation there at times there's a there's a conflict you go to Romans chapter 7 You've got the flesh trying to pull you in one direction. You've got the inner man. Paul talks about where Jesus Christ dwells, that new spirit that God put within you, that new heart. And it's going to pull this way. And the flesh is pulling this way. And if you're for real, you're going to go ultimately the right way. But if you stumble... That don't affect you in that sense. Oh, you'll pay for it. It'll cost you. It's not going to cost you heaven. Because Jesus said, and Paul wrote down in Philippians, that he that begun a good work in you will complete it in that day. Now, if you started the work, you didn't get anything. So, yeah, you'll... And that's... For a lot of these people that fall by the wayside, that's the reason they fell by the wayside because they were never apart. They were never called by God. They began their own journey without God really in it. But if God started the work in you, which he did in any true believer, God started the work. He will also complete it. Let's hurry on. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. 
I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, if I wasn't saying there, well, uh, we've already talked about that this be read unto all the holy brethren, just the ones that are holier than everybody, you know, the top echelons. No. He's talking about all the brothers, all the church, because they're all holy. They're all sanctified, because that's what that word means, separated. Dale Little, Rescue America Ministries.